everybody to another episode of Slow Secrets. I'm Julie Spock and today we are going to talk about investment. More specifically on tropical islands. <laughs> and more specifically about the most fun part which is building. Yay! So I'm super lucky because I met Paula on uh, the island and um, she was a friend of a friend and we had a lot of fun together and then I realized she was actually, what she was doing was blowing my mind. So, <laughs> welcome Paula. Thank you. To another episode. And I think if I could define who you are, you would be a sustainable building specialist. Yes. Right? Yes. So with your bamboo studio, you've built beautiful places on the island. And uh, I think you were inspired with your own journey because you had an awesome career in Singapore, making six figures, but she dropped it all. <laughs> And she came to the island and her story is amazing and I think she's going to tell you more about it, her house, Siwa. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> My name is Paula. Nice to be here again. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I am an architect and then I specialize, I did a master's in building performance and sustainable architecture. And then also I became trained for Secure Economy Ambassador. So combining everything is the result of my today's work. Mm -hmm. um, I was working in Singapore in corporate after I had done my master's and I was in, in a big corporate doing sustainable consulting no? it, for the projects. And yeah, it was a great job. We were working on big, um, high energy intensive buildings, so hospitals, data centers, airports. Those buildings, the clients really want to go sustainable because the bills, the energy bills they're paying are huge, right? Yeah. Also for the image, so that was great for a few years. And then, yeah, we came here. I came with my husband who already had started Hello, building the house. And um, we moved to our bamboo home that we built ourselves and designed ourselves. And we now live a very low impact life. Mm. And yeah, it was a journey, and now I have my architectural studio where I do architecture for others, right? Mm -hmm. Sustainable architecture for others. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. What a beautiful story. I think you are specialized in net zero housing. Yeah, so here... What does net zero mean? Yeah. It's such a big word, right? Yeah, net zero is like applied to many different... <laughs> Uh, you know, situations and industries. Mm. In architecture, net zero building means a building that doesn't um, need to buy energy or water from outside the building or mm -hmm. the site. So all of the water that the building consumes during operations yes. and all of the electricity that the building uses through operations, it's generated in the building or in the site of the building. So you know, it's supposed it's buildings with no impact for climate mm. change, right? Because yeah. they don't need to extract from outside. They can be self-sufficient. Yeah. However, it does ignore a huge part of architecture, which is the building process, the construction. Absolutely. And that accounts for a huge amount of carbon emissions to the mm -hmm. atmospheres, building process, the manufacturing process of the material, cement, for example. Yeah. One kilo of cement is one kilo of CO2 to the atmosphere. Right. Before huge. it arrives to the building site. Mm -hmm. So the impact of those materials is also very important mm -hmm. when we talk about the building sector's impact. However, in net zero, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that it's ignored, it's just not account for. The net zero yeah. accounts only for when the building is done and when you start using it. Yes. yes, it's very circular. Yeah, I, mean, I, I love circles. Yes, I like that you reuse the water. You think about your trash. You know, on all levels. And yeah. So in in Indonesia, because you don't have barely electricity provision, they don't provide you with water. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't provide you with waste collection. There is no sanitation infrastructure. No. You have to consider all of those things. Yeah. The, the what you need and what you will dispose mm -hmm. when you're doing your architecture here. But it's very nice to be this conscious. 
about what we for are me using. it was it, it was revolutionary yes like I was working on numbers uh, computers you know <laughs> it wasn't that tangible and now you come here and you can really notice it you can yes. see it you know and when you do your own house you have the power to design it and control it mm -hmm. when you live in a city in an apartment building yeah. it's really hard Excel exactly. your impact right because you have to consist with everybody to change things but when you have your own house you can definitely do things better, right? So that's exactly what happened to me. I arrived on the island and I started being very conscious about everything. Just my trash, my water, like, okay, how can I put solar in my house? How much is gonna cost? How can I be off the grid? Yes. Right? But then, even if you move to Bali, mm -hmm. where it's sometimes impossible to have a compost, but then if you move to Belgium or Australia, it's, it's like a whole other level. It's like, oh my God, I am producing so much trash. Like, I should give it on to go me to I'm going to be like a mission. You can do change, but it's more, it's more on a community level. Yeah. So it, it's, it's true that change starts on smaller groups yeah. and then it moves bigger, like I in neighborhoods. But it's not like you, your own, right? No. I think also it's, it's, it's about starting with that consciousness with yourself. And I have really had that on the island. And then I, when I go to Europe, I'm like, come on. Two question. Come on, guys. Like, where know, where does your, don't you, the like, toilet, think, where yes. does the water of your toilet go, yes. right? Yes. Like, where does it go? Like, can you reply to that? Can people reply to that? Yes. Do you really know that if it's going to a place that it's getting reused for something else? Because actually... Because it could. It's actually it's nature does it. That you can, nature yes. does it. We don't need to hire the biggest engineers. We have the yes. mother of all engineers yes. here already. Yeah. I think the, the, the impact of building is so clear when you are working in construction because mm -hmm. you see it. Yeah. It's so enormous. Um, and then the way buildings are designed, right? Like the first, to understand building performance, the first thing you need to understand is the physics of the building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The materials physics, the heat, how does the heat transmit from the sun to here, how humidity, yes. all of the things that impact your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Like how many degrees do you need to be at with what humidity level to be a comfort? Mm -hmm. And how can you play with those elements and those physics mm -hmm. that are passive, you don't need any machine to create it. Mm -hmm so that your building consumes the less possible yes. before you start thinking of solar panels and things that you need to add Absolutely. to bring you the electricity, right? So I, I, I built this house in Dili, which is a very local house, but it has natural air circulation. It is on stilts already, and it has big triangles with air flowing through, and then windows with mosquito nets. So it, the air just flows through. I don't need any air con. No, no. And we live the same, my house is the same. Yeah. But of course, if you're in a box, it's you're super hot. It's impossible yeah, or if your window is facing box. west and you have absolutely no shading device, yeah. no tree, nothing, and the sun hits the glass, the heat is inside. Ooh. But if it hits a wall, if you paint it white, it would reflect yes. the heat and it will never come in the room, absolutely. right? If you paint the wall black, the heat will come through. Yeah. So. This is all this building physics and passive mm -hmm. design that is really important to do first. That's the first exercise you need to do before you do yeah, next year. Analyze. Because if you don't do it, it you're going to have to spend a lot more money to make it net zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I collect rainwater yes. on a tank that it costs me money because I need to build, right? Normally yes. you want to build it under the house so that you don't occupy more yes. land, no? Yeah. So. You build it under the house, you have all your rain collection, you use the water, you can filter it if you want it, you, you use the water and then you can separate two waters, the gray water is mm -hmm. the showers and the sinks and then you have the black water which is the toilets. Yes. Normally we would put also laundry with the toilets because of the chemicals of the soaps. Absolutely. And your kitchen should have a grease trap underneath or something to mm -hmm. separate so that... Yeah, that's important. And that we in my house bring it to planter boxes that we build they're called wastewater gardens it's like a yeah. little um let's say labyrinth of water that it needs to go slowly slowly to go through all these planter boxes that you put with 
you know, different kind of filtration sun. through sand and different, you know, sizes, yes. stones and stuff. Nice. And then that goes, you know, it, it has to be quite long so that the process of, you know, cleaning the water happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it ends up in a tank that we reuse and we water all of our garden and yeah, our fantastic. toilets use that. If you do this versus not doing it, then you need a much bigger r rainwater tank. Mm -hmm. And you need to rain more, which yes. is something that you can control. So reusing the water helps you a lot. And then everything ends up in the toilet, which goes or in the on, on the landscape or in the toilet. And the toilet, you can also bring it to one of the bioseptic yeah. tanks that are very available nowadays. Yes. And from there, you can also reuse for irrigation. So Perfect. at the end, it's kind of like you try to give back to the earth clean water mm -hmm. that the earth can Give use you. instead of polluting i mean yeah much better. wastewater it's a huge problem worldwide yes. no it's the um eutrophication no? of the rivers when they become the algae grows so much because of the fertilizers and the nitrogen then they put on the fields and then when the rain goes all these fields like drain into the rivers oh. and the lakes and then that nitrogen makes the algae go nuts it's like you know uh, Asteroids for, <laughs> and the problem is that these algae cover the surface so much, so that the the light doesn't go in the lake, and then all the fish die. But oh, this no. is like this is a huge problem worldwide. It's, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like it's happened once. Yeah. This is, and this is because of the water, because we are waste throwing wasted water that is polluted and contaminated. Mm -hmm. Nature has a way to work with it, but we don't allow it because we just dump it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the same happens with our organic waste in cities. Yes. I'm working with these BSF mm -hmm. projects, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to design a facility for BSF farming to convert organic waste. Yeah. But the scales of the municipal waste... It's huge. It's so enormous. So we're trying to find out what's the best way possible to design these facilities without becoming really mechanized yeah yeah, yeah. because you have to make it relatively e like you know an easy use so that yes. people from any country and background and education level can actually operate and manage these facilities absolutely right? so that is really the key because we're so many exactly well no, the numbers are outrageous mm -hmm. you won't even imagine yeah. and the cost of this is huge but you produce compost and then you can produce yeah. larvae from waste they don't allow to be fed for animals yeah. because of the rare metals that they might have yeah. uh, only if you treat waste from agricultural production mm -hmm. which it hasn't been going through the garbage bin mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's also a huge part of architecture that mm -hmm. it's it can also be net zero right yes. if you design a facility like this like a you know, yes. wa organic waste conversion facility with Black Soldier Fly, you can also make it uh, net zero. We made one here. Yes. You know, at the end, it's all trying to make everything that consumes as little as possible with the best design as possible. Mm -hmm. And architecture net zero in Indonesia has nothing to do with an architecture net zero in Germany. No, totally Then different. I can assure you. Different story. And the globalization, mm. you know, while everybody are wearing the same clothes, the same brands, mm -hmm. same shoes, and eating the same food everywhere, you know, watching the same shows, at the end it's like, you know, globalization conquered the world, including architecture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you go to Dubai and you see these skyscrapers, but you see them also in New York. Yeah. And you see them also in Shanghai or Beijing. Yeah. And the climate of those cities is completely the opposite. Yes. So technology didn't really help architecture. No. So if you tell me how to build sustainable in Indonesia, I'll tell you. How were they doing it a hundred years ago? Then you, <laughs> you have your answer. And it, in fact, Indonesia is one of those countries that has this incredible tradition of vernacular architecture, which each island has their own roof style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's so rich in yes. culture and knowledge. So when I design, first thing I do is that, get inspiration from that architecture, because yes. that architecture works. That architecture is passive, and that architecture was probably in its zero. <laughs> <laughs>
building in Indonesia, if someone would like to start a project here, right? On a small scale, like a house or on a bigger scale, like a proper business, what are the materials that you would say are, you know, most sustainable in Indonesia? What should they think about? Because it depends a lot on the kind of project what the clients want. Yes. Obviously, anything that is local material mm -hmm. is more sustainable, mm -hmm. right? So, but then you have all these types of woods and they have very different specifics. Some wood are more sustainable than others. Mm -hmm. So what you, what you think about on a sustainable material is obviously one would be like how long it has to travel until it gets to your place. Yes. But then a huge part is the embodied energy, which means what is the energy required from that material to get out of the natural place it was yes. until it arrives to your site. Yeah. Right? So if my house, for example, is made out of bamboo, it's bamboo that is grown here yes. locally. I love bamboo. And bamboo grows super fast. It's a grass, yeah. which is incredible, <laughs> right? You built your house with the grass. Yes. Um, and... It needs like, I don't know, four or five years to grow, you know, tall and you can use it. And so it, it's so sustainable and you can cut the tree, you know, the bamboo and it regrows again. Yes. So if you think about it, then what is the energy to bring that material to your site would be the sun, mm -hmm. no, the water. Normally they grow on, on, you know, wet areas by rivers and stuff, but it's naturally irrigated yeah 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 uh, then you have the sun then you have whatever tool you use to cut it mm -hmm. which here is probably manual yes then you have to transport to site bamboo that's the only cons i would say yeah which is that you actually have to use very long vehicles because they're long pieces mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. Of, uh, there's one part that I forgot, which is the treatment, mm -hmm. because it yeah. gets eaten, right, yes, by, yes, yes. by termites. termites. So you treat it in borax acid, which is like pools where you put it for a month and then you need it. Yeah. And that acid is not the most sustainable, but I bet you nature can neutralize that acid if someone puts effort into yes. finding the way of you know, sure. dealing with that waste. Um, However, the borax stays there, you can, you know, put a lot of trunks, it's not that intensive, you know, mm -hmm, if compared mm -hmm. to other materials. And then you just need to put it on your site, so that's the only energy you use. If you think, if you compare with concrete, mm. uh, concrete is sand, is uh, of different grades, is uh, bigger stones and yes. sand, and then you have water also, and then you have cement, and cement is limestone that is taken from the mine, then is brought into the cementeras, you know, the place where they do the cement factories. And there you need to heat it up to a thousand degrees to make wow. clinker. So that's why one kilo of CO2 of, of cement is one kilo of CO2 because wow. the process, before you even mix the concrete in the, you know, <laughs> vehicles or in your, or manually or whatever, you have to I had um, no idea. make that. That's yes. like incredible. So, but if you think about it, Cement is like 8% of the emissions globally. No. I promise you. Oh my God. Yeah. And India used more cement in, I mean, China used more cement in one decade than the US in its whole history. Oh my God. <laughs> so when you start putting things into perspective, <laughs> I mean, my bamboo house has a very small impact, oh, of wow. course. However, this concept of circularity and trying to make mm. buildings also dismantable like you can dismantle them and yes. reuse the material so in that sense steel that has a lot of impact as well you use like these really hot you know yeah. uh, places to uh, to shape the steel and stuff you can reuse it forever and ever and ever yes, right true. while cement you really can't no you can't so um there is a lot of these aspects that you need to consider yes. there is one library that the university of bath made which is the energy associated to all of the building materials, maybe not oh, in the world, nice. but it's like a proper library. Oh, of... maybe we can link that in the comments. Yeah, because yeah. then you are able to see, you know, I think it's really hard to like not yeah, use yeah, no. any cement in your projects no, right now, right? Uh, you need for the foundations, yes. you need steel also even in bamboo to connect the pieces, right? So, um, then, you know, you, here you have a lot of stone. Mm -hmm. Stone is relatively low impact mm -hmm. because you just need to cut it and bring it, right? Yes. That is, it doesn't have any manufacturing process, while a tile does, for example. Mm 
Uh, but here you have terracotta tiles, which is clay, which is local clay. Yeah, and that's a lot more so sustainable nice. than... Yeah. So you have to think of the more manufacturing local. process, the, yeah. loca the, the locality, like mm. making sure that it's something manufactured nearby. You know, I actually bought my house on the island. Yeah. Like we found a local house because it's like very old teak. So also for the termite problem, when it's already like, you know, super yes, old, so hard, you know, they like can't it. get in anymore. So we bought the house from this local family and then we dismantled it. We like mounted it back on my land and then we like remodeled it with uh, hajumas, yeah. uh, wood, like a little Swiss cabin basically. Yeah, so that's, you I mean, you're relatively almost like 100% recycle <laughs> content, right? <laughs> So that's what circular means, actually. Yes. You know, that house belonged to someone else and they got dismantled and then it moved. Yes. Um, teak wood is quite sustainable. It needs like 12 years to grow and there's a lot of teak forests here that they rotate, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, that's what is considered sustainable wood. Mm -hmm. When you can, you know, you know, you trace where it comes from and then you mm -hmm. can actually, you know, um, a trace you know that they replant as much as they can yeah they cut so it's yes. always like in yeah, rotation I actually right? went also to Job Jakarta to buy our Joglo mm -hmm. Jogli is like a, 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 a Javanese home so it's like the, the family room of it's the, the traditional roof of yes. the Javanese and it has this the spiky and then flat roof it's beautiful and yeah. then every time they have other children they add limasans which is like one room that comes and clips around the Joglo Anyway, we wanted that for our reception area for our property. So we went around all these villages and I remember there was nothing. Like we were driving on two stripes of cement. Yes. <laughs> there was no road, but we were like mm, on two stripes of cement and it was all forests of teak. Yes, of course. All forests of teak. And then we met this little old man and he was like, I want to sell my house, you know, and we visited a couple and then we chose one. They dismantled all of it and then they brought it over and like you know yeah. set it back up uh, and it became our reception area and it's beautiful i love it and same the teak is super old so we didn't have any problems with termites in that building anyway but um like on a you know boutique property level i think you've done also really big projects lately yeah right? so if you do big i i it's really hard unless they want to go for wood to not use cement mm. So you normally focus more on making sure that the building kind of works with the site. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's well oriented, it's well positioned in the site, so you have minimum disturbance in the sense of, you know, digging and mm -hmm. disturbing what it's around. Then water is super huge here, so mm -hmm. you do reinjection wells, you bring all the drainage that comes from the from the rain. It's a little bit like permaculture, you yes. know, you make sure that it filtrates inside. Mm -hmm. So you replenish the well that they are taking from. So you move the Collect yeah. rainwater like crazy. <laughs> and um, yeah, because at the end you have a lot of roof surface. So you yes. collect all of that roof surface. Yes, yes, In yes. a little small house, you can't only collect what you yes, are, absolutely. your roof space, right? So you try to apply it in big size and then if you you know the solar right now indonesia changed their, their plm policy for solar panels yes. and if you put solar and you sell to the grid they pay you 100 percent. so this is an incentive right. but we have so many power cuts yeah you know it, yes. right challenges here yes so solar makes a lot of sense because of that yes right so it's it's relatively easy to sell it, yeah, because it's a backup system that doesn't have a generator, taka 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 taka, 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 taka. maintenance problems that it offers a generator, yeah. a diesel that it's smoky. So what is your opinion on solar batteries or no batteries? So here I would always use batteries because yeah. of the power cuts. Yes, but if I could avoid it, because that's expensive. What is better, batteries or generator? Batteries by far. Yeah. But if you have a really big building with a lot of consumption, yes. you will not be able to do batteries for yeah, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A generator is capable, is a combustion engine to <laughs> provide a lot more power, right? Yes. So if you have, like, I'm making now 14 rooms with AC and, you know, long distribution pump, pumps oh, and stuff. Yeah, and still you design a building as passive as you can yeah, yeah, yeah. with you know the, the rooms are like little caves I know they're gonna be fresh at all times yes 
you know you cross ventilate them for sure yes you make everything so that you know that if they use it they are not gonna pump it because they will not need it yeah, yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so very important all of this and even if the project is really big and you know you're not gonna achieve the net zero mm -hmm. you're gonna try to minimize the impact as I much love as this possible quote from Bono. we don't need a handful of people doing it perfectly we need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Yeah, so I mean, there are challenges. Yes. It's not like nothing is. <laughs> when people want everything solved, you know, <laughs> like you can't do it. So, this quote is from Obama, who said that he used to say in his office, better is good. I yes. say, like, I cannot yes. do it all, but I will improve this yes. and that, you know? So, in sustainable architecture, it's the, it's the same. Yeah. You try to improve as much as you can. You know you have a client that mm. is going to pay, so you have to sell it while you're doing it. Yeah. And that's a huge part of our job. Absolutely. And that's why I needed to move here. Yes. Because I did it on my own life with myself, you know, so Such that when I example. sell it, I'm talking from You've my own it. experience. Yeah, yes. it's amazing. This is, I think, quite important. Bravo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this um, pretty much rounds up what I wanted to ask you about. Net zero housing and architecture. Yes, yes very good. But maybe, um, maybe you could share, especially in Indonesia, a hardship that you had, and how a you overcame it. When I mean, because <laughs> the process is, I've been here for seven years already, <laughs> based right. So we started building our house with <clears throat> one screwdriver. That was the machine used for my house. So and this is real. So this means that actually my house is so, so sustainable, even on the construction process. Um, but my, you know, one of the biggest things that I would say as a recommendation is to learn the language. Yeah, I agreed. Because for example, in architecture, my office, my team, they're like, they've been with me since the beginning. No mm. one's left. Mm -hmm. We're six in total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they are excellent professionals they learned a lot while working with me and they mm -hmm. you know i know even if i close my office they'll be so well off yeah but they didn't speak english while in bali and a lot of places here people come they try to open their companies and they need to hire english speaking people mm -hmm. and that takes away a lot of the talent absolutely options that you have agreed because an architect or a civil engineer a structural engineer they don't need to understand English. You yeah, are in yeah. Lombok, right? For sure. So that's something that I learned while building our house because mm -hmm. the guys from the village obviously didn't speak English. <laughs> and that was something that I think it was a huge advantage for me I in agreed. my work. Yeah. Because it, then it was easy to communicate. And while I'm the only one communicating with my clients, which is a bit annoying sometimes because mm -hmm. I, I have to do it myself. No one else can do it in my office. In the other hand, I have great professionals, you know, yes. that it doesn't matter if they don't speak English because I know they're great, while other people are more constrained, right? They yes. need to hire the English speaking because that's the most yeah, important I, thing for them, right? No, learn the language for sure. Yes. Like, that's like a no-brainer, I agree. Yes. So, I think that's it on my end, but maybe you'd like to add something? No, I would just say that, I mean, the world has a lot to do. The it building sector is the most pollutant and bigger emitter sector in the world. Mm. Second one is agriculture. Wow. Let's, so let's talk better food industry, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. including meat and all of that. Yeah. And the third one is transportation. So buildings are really important. Yes. And we all live and do everything inside buildings. So we might as well also use them properly. Maybe. Yeah, so this would be the third part to use the building properly because yeah. I can design something and I need the users to also yes. open the window, ventilate, you know, put the shading device here, roll the shutter yeah. first. Yeah. So that would be the third step. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For being on our podcast again. And where can people find you if they want to connect with you? So my office is called Bambook Studio and my email is paula at bambookstudio.com. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.